The lectionary for today has us back to John chapter 3, a familiar passage. It's on page 863 in your pew Bibles. Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Many people think that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, but he did not. There were many before him in the early 1800s that had come up with that bright idea. Um, But he improved on it. He wrote all the patents to fabricate it. He was the one who really did perfect the science behind creating a longer-lasting incandescent bulb. But he didn't invent it. Now, many of us think about the invention of the light bulb as that watershed moment in history when everything changed for the better, where mechanical power was giving way to a new standard that we call electricity. No doubt technology took off and the world would never be the same again. This is the late 1800s. Even though Christie Street in Menlo Park, New Jersey, was one of the first streets in the world to use electric lights for illumination, the light bulb was never, ever Edison's focus. No, he and his team had something far bigger in mind. They imagined a network of electrical power that would be available to an entire city. So these were the guys in Menlo Park who said, hey, why don't we think of the power grid? as something that would be a lucrative endeavor. Let's bring electricity to thousands of people at the same time. And there were other innovators and inventors who were working on similar projects. Why? As cities and industry grew, civilization demanded a way to see at night. Or to put it more bluntly, people were afraid of the dark. And perceived or real, they were afraid of what might be lurking in the shadows. We've all experienced this fear at some point in our lives. I know I have. 
We panic at what we cannot see, and we shudder at the deeper truths we are incapable of comprehending. And many of us, when we're afraid, we attempt to cloak our secrets, our mistakes, our sins under the cover of darkness. So in today's gospel, we are, we're reading about a man who had a serious problem. He was a teacher in the synagogue in Jerusalem during Jesus' time, and he'd grown used to having all the theological answers, and he liked being known in town as an expert. He taught hundreds of people uh, God's truths, while Jesus' teachings have probably were confusing to him, they also seem to have captivated him. Jesus told people they needed to change direction, just as John the Baptist was telling people to repent and change direction. And for some odd reason, this man wanted to hear more. Nicodemus had heard plenty of what Jesus was doing in the city of Jerusalem. So much, in fact, he thought to pay him a visit and wait until all of his neighbors were sound asleep. There's no doubt that he was afraid of being discovered. After all, he was a Pharisee. He was a leader within the, the ruling council, a council that was known as the Sanhedrin in those days. He's a prominent member of a group of religious leaders whom Jesus and John the Baptist criticized for being hypocrites. Many from his own religious party were intensely jealous of Jesus and frustrated by him because he undermined their authority and challenged their views. In fact, most daylight conversations between the Pharisees and Jesus tended to be antagonistic. Nevertheless, Nicodemus could not overlook the weight of evidence of Jesus' success and he could not get away from his personal conviction that Jesus had some kind of divine mission, possessing divine authority by which he spoke and healed people. It was an itch he just had to scratch. <laughs> Perplexed and awestruck, Nicodemus found himself searching, believing that Jesus might actually have answers to his deepest longings. Many of us are searching even now, some of those of you who are worshiping with us online, you're searching. Or you're watching this sermon video months after I've preached it and you find yourself searching today. What are you looking for? What do you want? I've come to believe that there are a lot of people in the world who are searching because they want to experience something that's real. They want someone to show them something that actually works, that's not fake, but is authentic, that is as real as the person standing in front of them, the same person they could tap on the shoulder. Some go to church a couple of times a month, some go once a quarter, and others maybe go on Christmas and Easter. But there's this emptiness. There's, there's this feeling, this search going on in here, and something tells us that we're just not quite right with God, or, or with ourselves, or with our neighbors. I think this is what John 3 is really all about, is that Nicodemus had these same feelings in his search and he made his way to this teacher from the Galilee. And then what happens is Jesus reveals to him that he's already aware of his heart problem, of the emptiness he feels inside. I've always been fascinated by Nicodemus choosing to visit Jesus at night. <laughs> it's like an elder who would come to me late in the evening with a problem. Late at night, two in the morning, Steve, we got a serious problem at the church. Uh, is it that bad you had to come to see me at 2.30 in the morning? Or is it that you don't want anyone else to know about this problem? But here Nicodemus comes to Jesus late at night. Understood symbolically, it's, 
it's a person living in darkness of this world who soon encounters the light. And this is John, right? John does a lot of these contrasts. Light and darkness are frequently used throughout the gospel. In fact, we learn quickly that those living in darkness reject Jesus because he's the light that exposes their mistakes, their sins. Nicodemus could have sent anyone He was a person of influence, of wealth, of power. Send an assistant. Send a disciple. But no, he goes himself. He wants to see Jesus face to face. He wants to examine the real person in order to separate fact from fiction. And During the course of this nocturnal interview, Jesus not only taught Nicodemus a few things, he exposes his weaknesses as well. And the first lesson that Nicodemus is taught is that those who want to enter the kingdom of God must be born from above. Now, the the Pentecostals and and those in the charismatic churches have really cornered the market on this passage. Right? It's this is this is this is for them everything. Being born again. You hear that language. If you've ever visited a church that's more charismatic or has Pentecostal influences, this is, the, this is the saying, you must be born from above. And as I've said to many of you, where, where they take a step too far, for me anyway, is when they say you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you must have the sign that you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues. Now, I, I'm not disputing that that's real and that happens. But I am not going to say that if you're someone who's not sure you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and you're not speaking in tongues, you're somehow a second-class Christian. That's not a message that we want to present here at Central or in any Reformed church, really. But I will say that Jesus is right not just because he's the Lord of light and life, but he is right in the sense that if we're not born from above, we cannot comprehend or see the kingdom for what it really is. Being born from above is no ordinary concept. And it certainly wasn't back then. It was revolutionary. And so in Reformed circles and in Reformed theology, we chalk this up to a big word called regeneration. And that's the kind of word you need to take off the shelf, wipe it down a little bit, clean it up, and make better sense of it. It's a technical term referring to God revitalizing a person by implanting new desire purpose and moral ability that leads to a positive response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe as Reformed Christians that all of this is a gift and a work of God. So that night, Nicodemus is taught that the kingdom of God is personal, not national or or ethnic. And its entrance requirements are repentance and spiritual rebirth. I think these were probably truths that rocked his theological world. Why else would he have said, wait a second, how can these things be? What are you talking about? What? What? Maybe he walked away feeling convicted. Maybe he was asking himself, are we really only able to enter God's kingdom after a radical new beginning? Must I really be born from above? I wonder if what shocked Nicodemus the most was Jesus' assertion that he wasn't really in a right relationship with God. But then again, if anyone was on God's side, it was Nicodemus. He fasted two days a week, he spent two hours a day in prayer at the temple, and he tithed all of his income to God. All of it. I mean, he's the equivalent of a professor of theology, and he's very smart. And he's very pious. He is inquisitive. He's honest. All of these things have got to count for something, right? That night, Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, your religion cannot save you. 
You must be born from above because all of your knowledge, all of your piety, and all of your good deeds will never be enough. Ever. So you think about that. Maybe he heard Jesus saying to him, Nicodemus, you need a heart transplant. You need a heart that's been transformed by the love and the forgiveness of God. Are we more like Nicodemus than we'd like to admit this morning? How often do we get stuck in our own assumptions about God? How often does our own limited understanding prevent us from seeing God's reality? How many times do we stumble around in the dark, tripping over our shoelaces, unwilling to admit that flipping a switch will shine God's light into our confusion? The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ knows exactly what's going on in our lives. Jesus knows our deepest longings and challenges us to new life. He knows our problem is in our hearts. Our hearts need to be changed. They need to be aligned with God the Father and with Jesus the Son and with the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder today, I wonder, what needs to change in your life? What needs to change today? What is it? The story of Nicodemus' life reminds us that in the midst of darkness, we can reach out to God. We can reach out to God. When our life journeys lead us down dark roads, times when we cannot find our way and we are unsure of which way to turn, that's when God finds us, welcomes us, teaches us about God's great love and forgiveness for us, for the world, and our need to change for the better. As Reformed Christians, we have always believed that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the book of Titus clears it all up for us. In chapter 3, we read, uh, He saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Again, this is a gift from God. You cannot do it on your own. And there's even more good news. Jesus told Nicodemus, there's a mystery to this regeneration. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We see the John 3.16 signs at Wimbledon. We see them at football games and baseball games. We see John 3.16 held up on street corners. But do we really know what it says? Do we believe these words? Are you living in darkness today? Are you feeling your way along? Are you stumbling over obstacles? Have you tripped? Are you on the floor? Can you even see anything in your own darkness? Do you think that the darkness is the problem? It's not. Jesus meets us where we are, in the dark or in noonday sun. And John 3.16 often gets reworded as, God so loved to mean. God so loved Helen. God so loved Willa. God so loved Mary. God so loved, put your name in the blank. But the next verse is just as important for us to take personally. God didn't send God's Son to condemn us, but to save us. So then the question really is, is are we worth saving? Why does God even care about us? What is so special about us that we would be important to the one who made heaven and earth? And the simple answer to that question is absolutely nothing. This isn't about the darkness. And it isn't even about us. This is all about God. 
and who God is and what God does for us. Even on our best days, the work of God is as mysterious to us as Jesus saying to Nicodemus, the wind blows where it chooses and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. God wants to save us. God wants to save you so that you never have to fumble in the dark again. You think about that. And let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of your word to us today. A word that reminds us that even in the midst of of darkness, we can reach out to you. Just as Nicodemus did when he visited your son at night. When our life journeys lead us down dark roads, times when we cannot find our way, and when we are unsure of which way to turn, find us. Welcome us. Teach us about your great love for us, for the world. And change our lives for the better. Even now, help us to follow and trust your Son with our whole lives. For we are bold to pray all of this in his name and all God's people say, Amen.